quiet on the set. <laughs> We're live. Okay. Awesome. Well, welcome everyone. I guess, uh, well, we have one new, semi-new attendee. I guess you've been to some meetings in the past. So anyway, um, we've been around since 78, 501c3 nonprofit educational focus. We do uh, meetings on all kinds of topics of interest to people transitioning from product to business. So our meeting coming up, Last meeting of the year, which will be December 10th, because we won't obviously do late December, but December 10th, uh, Gary Knapp coming. He's an expert in sales logistics, distribution, packaging, and pricing. He's got an RV product that he uh, transitioned from retail to Amazon, and it's really boosted his sales nicely. So he's probably some good input on, you know, how you sell and distribute products is something that's kind of a further step out. But Good to, uh, good to have some familiarity with. So um, we'll get, again, go ahead and do our round robin to start and tell us what's new with you. Hi, my name is Emil uh, My name is Jim. Uh, Perfect Fitting Shoes. This is the company that I'm with. I uh, designed shoes that are adjusting to heel. And uh, we're working on some samples being developed in Mexico. And it's just, it, it, the problem is it just costs a lot of money to make all these samples and no one's satisfied with what you make. And I made a bunch of them for men, but men don't really care about them so much unless you got someone that's an influencer. So I reversed my designs and now I'm designing for a lot of shoes for women because they have a specific need everywhere. I turned to look online and talking about women that have heel problems because there are women that go to fashion events where shoes are bigger than they should because they don't want to have blisters on the back of their feet. Mm -hmm. And so you see the shoes, you've got a beautiful starlet, whatever, walking down the red carpet, and you look at her shoes and there's a big old gap in the back. And I can eliminate that. It's just a matter of, you make one style and I say, well, I like it, but I want to see this. And then you make that and I say, well, but I need to see this. And then you got to make another size. It's an expensive process. So. In a nutshell, we're just we're looking for funding, so we're going to do uh, get a, a sample made that is sufficient to where we can crowdsource funding to kickstart. So I wanted to okay. attend yeah. this program to really get information to the most of us provide my assistance. So. Oh, great! It's the right presentation, Gary. I, I have uh, two fitness products. One of them is just to market. The second one um, we're heading towards manufacturing on. And uh, so I'm looking for the same thing, looking at uh, funding options. Um, so this is right up the alley. To Great. Consider this. Hi, uh, yeah, my name is Ben, and I have a patent that I was never able to reach with. It may still be active. And I have some ideas about funding for inventions, and uh, I wanted to hear about. Uh, new ways to fund. Uh, yeah, because that's that's always where people stumble on. Yes, I think ninety eight percent of the patents don't make it to commercially viable products. So it's 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 a small minority that yeah. that hit big, and it's you know patents aren't really related to business success, at least not initially. And the thing is, like a lot of big corporations, they might do a lot of patenting on things, technologies they're not sure they're ever going to. Commercialize them, so you always have a big mass of patents. Well, you not to excited about you, but that I just heard the guy that invented, or the guy that sold the business ring to Amazon for like a billion dollars. Oh, the like doorbell, they do a doorbell. He doesn't have a single patent. He doesn't have a single patent. Hmm. Well, maybe. He didn't I have any things to take like that. I moved away when I heard that. He said he had that. Not, they had him on Shark Tank. And he was promoting the fact he doesn't have a single patent in this business. So for a billion dollars. So. Well, you know, there's there's a lot of things that go into the value of the business. And intellectual property is just a piece of it. Although even if you're, you're not technically patentable, you can have trademark and copyright. No, there's a lot of ways to protect yourself even though you don't get a patent. That's not all I'm talking about. Yeah. Apparently, he was able to do something where 
he was able to create value for his company sufficiently for Amazon saw yeah. and able to jump on this. So well, that's it's that's really interesting because I've got one, and you know, there's there's a lot of like you look at Amazon, there's lots of Chinese video doorbells. Sure, but he's he's kind of got the one that's the best packaged, and it, it just seems to work the best. And you know, so he just did the business end better. Sure, it's the same technology for most everyone. So that's a big difference. Anyway, we've got John Eckstein, who's presented probably a dozen times over the years. Maybe. Since the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> so he's a securities lawyer at Fairfield and Woods. And uh, he's here to talk about Jobs Act update, uh, state stock issues, and, and other applicable things. Oh, the crowd uh, oh so is this working or not? It's still, it's at 51%. What does that mean? It's still up to 80. So I have no slides. Not for a little bit. Okay. So you get started and I'll get it going. So uh, thanks everybody for coming and thanks a lot for uh, being on the uh, streaming video that I'm speaking to. <laughs> My name is, I want to thank you all for being interested and I was asked to talk about crowdfunding and uh, do an update from a talk I did about two and a half years ago to this group. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Rocky Mountain Inventors Association, Roger Jackson, for asking me to do this. Um, actually, I have a soft spot in my heart, Roger knows, for the Rocky Mountain Inventors Association since I gave a talk back in 1983 uh, to the Rocky Mountain Inventors of Congress. The name has changed, but the group's the same. And it generated one of the best uh, attorney client relationships I've ever had in my life. So. And that was a, a, a company that uh, became, uh, was a bioscience company with a lot of different kinds of technologies. It did four different rounds of financing. They developed a nice portfolio of intellectual property um, and uh, venture capital financing came in. They got rid of the other technologies. The company went public, did three rounds of financing and was ultimately bought by a subsidiary of Baxter which was a nice 13 year run. Baxter? Yeah, the big. They're the big uh, uh, IV. Huh? They were a big blood company. Well, ours okay. was a blood company called Somatogen. It was basically a Boulder based company. And uh, although it started here in Denver at the, uh, uh, what's called the Hill Science Center on, on Colorado Boulevard and I. It, oh, the CU Science. Uh, CU Health Science. Uh, yeah. uh, and something called the Oliver Roosevelt Institute for Cancer Research. But I digress. It was a great relationship. I, I love this group, and uh, good things can happen out of this group. So I'm a fan. And now I need to do my advertisement for Fairfield and Woods by my employer. Fairfield and Woods has been around for 85 years. It is a firm of about 45 lawyers now. We tend um, not to have the uh, highest hourly rates, but our rates are fairly high. Uh, we do a lot of startups. Uh, we don't represent a lot of individuals. Uh, we do, um, if you've heard of the Rockies Venture Club, that's one of our clients. If you've heard of the Innosphere in Fort Collins, that's one of our clients. And uh, I myself have sort of graduated from representing the companies to representing the investors in the companies. So uh, I put, helped put together, I have permission say this, I put together the uh, Innosphere Fund up at Fort Collins for the Innosphere Accelerator, put together the Rockies Venture uh, Fund One for the Rockies Venture Club. So that was, um, the Rockies Venture Club is actually acting as an investor? No. Or a syndicator? Or? No. Uh, if you, you should go to their website, Peter Adams took this over about six years ago been around for about 33 years, 34 years. Um, there's the Rockies Venture Club, which is a 501c6 uh, trade association. It's like, a, like a chamber of commerce type entity. That's the one that's been around a while. And if you go to their meetings, um, they, the new business model for that is they train entrepreneurs on how to make pitches for money. Right. And they train investors on how to understand 
pitches for money. A lot of the end, they assembled a group of right. They have the angel, and then they put them together, and they have uh, two big meetings a year: uh, Colorado Capital Connection and the uh, Angel Capital Summit. Okay, and uh, it's definitely an educational process to go and learn and see how these things work. And I'm a, a fan of the client. Uh, I'm always a fan of our clients, but that's a good one. They do have the Colorado Capital Connection coming up later this month, so next week. But uh, what happens is I think they form, uh, there's something called the Rockies Venture Advisor, which is an exempt reporting advisor. Every venture capital fund has an investment advisor that's called an exempt reporting advisor since the Dodd-Frank law came into effect. Um, because Dodd-Frank, uh, you'll recall back then, it was right after 2008, 2009, and all the troubles, Congress decided to regulate investment advisors. We're off topic, by the way. And so the uh, family offices and venture capital carved out exceptions from the regulation of investment advisors and private funds, which came in through the uh, Dodd-Frank law. But it's not fully exempt from the investment advisors for venture capital funds have to do a filing every year. They're unregistered, but they have to do a filing. So there, now there's this light bit of regulation on top of venture capital advisors. It didn't exist before. We also represent the Altera funds. They have six funds. And I have permission to talk about them. They're an oil and gas technology fund. And they're the last fund, $176 million fund. So they're, they're all set up the same way all across America. So we represent some venture capital funds, that's what I do. But I, I know a bit about, and I have given talks about Dodd-Frank, and then the Jobs Act, which came out, which was April 5th of 2012, and uh, I went around last year and gave a CLE programs to general practitioner lawyers in eight different uh, locales, like Grand Junction, Durango, Fort Collins, Denver, uh, Springs, uh, about securities law, because a lot of general practitioners don't don't do work in securities area, and yet they could if they would limit their activities and certain to, to the easier stuff. Right. And I used to be a solo practitioner, used to have my own law firm, and I like I like lawyers. I, I, I want to see lawyers succeed. I don't want to see lawyers get in trouble or fail. So that's that's sort of my shtick. Yeah, you may have a bit off the track, but I wanted to talk about Fairfield and Woods because it's a local firm. It used to be the smallest of the big firms, now it's the largest of the local firms. And it's a good law firm, Full Service Solutions is our model. And, uh, so we're all, we're so anyway, the, the, um, pardon? the Rockies Venture Club, so they're not classified as an investment advisor. The Rockies Venture Club is not an investment advisor. They have an affiliate called Rockies Venture Advisor which is an exempt reporting advisor. It gives advice only to venture capital funds. They have the Rockies Venture Fund One, uh, which is a limited partnership. They have something else called um, Rockies, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but they have another entity that uh, forms these single purpose syndicates that invest in the companies that present to the Rockies Venture Club. So when basically, they don't always invest, but let's say five or six guys hear a presentation, decide we ought to invest in this, and uh, one of them takes the lead, they form a little syndicate, and now that's like a little venture fund. So they have one unlimited company. partners pool their money? In, into one, no, it doesn't have anything to do with the venture capital fund. The Rockies Venture Fund one is a separate business practice, Rockies Venture Management forms these little one-off syndicates. They have 37 or 40. These are on their website, it's talked about. Mm -hmm. And so the Rockies Venture Club has a presenter who has five or six people who want to invest in the company. They form a little, an LLC. And that's like a little one-purpose venture capital fund. And under two no-action letters from the SEC that came out in March of 2013, that's OK. And that's really a venture, little venture fund for this exempt reporting advisor. And all across America, these angel groups like the Rockies Venture Club have formed up entities like this.
So this just happens to be the one in Colorado. But I, I'm still off the track. Here. So you have like some people manage it, and then you have like passive investors. Passive investors in these little LLCs, so that LLC might be an investor in your portfolio company, but behind the closet, maybe seven or eight high net worth individuals who invested through this little LLC in your company. It's a it's a cool little thing, and the SEC has opened up on that since the jobs. I mean, that was a nice thing. That's not part of my presentation, but it was one place where small business capital formation has has worked. Uh, but it's a particular kind of company, and there's somebody that the SEC can go to touch if it doesn't work right. Because even though it's not a registered investment advisor, they still have to file their form in ADB. So, from the SEC's point of view, they got something to lose. They could lose their status as an exempt reporting advisor. So, when you deal with regulators, and I'll get back to this, they don't like the idea of regulators like to regulate. They don't like to create free association without regulation. So there's always uh, a little string or two attached to things. I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that as we go through my presentation. I see it's still loading up. Yeah, well, it's, it's getting there. <laughs> OK, so eventually, uh, we'll get to the slides, which have been sent out in advance of this meeting. Did everyone get the slides? Okay. Now, let me just mention a couple of things about these slides. Um, if you don't come to the talk, you don't get to hear the corrections and the updates from the slides. So <laughs> thank you all for showing up. Roger will have this. Number two, I have an additional handout, which was not sent out. Okay. You will have that for sure. So thank you for showing up. It's worth paying the 10 bucks and belonging to the organization, as some of you did tonight. Okay. In any event, uh, thanks for coming. And I'm moving now to the second slide. This is my update from two and a half years ago. So on the second slide, uh, it's sort of an introduction to basic securities law principles. And uh, so as, as every, I always start my talks to non-lawyers with this, there's a comprehensive scheme of regulation of securities in this country. If you are going to sell securities, the sale and the security must be exempt unless it's registered. There are many exemptions, and this applies both at the federal level and the state level. At the federal level, it's the Securities Exchange Commission. At the state level, it's the Colorado Securities Commissioner and uh, the Department of Regulatory Agencies. So it's got to be registered unless it's exempt. Uh, also, anybody who acts as an intermediary has to be registered unless exempt, like a broker dealer. A broker dealer must be registered at the federal and state level. So, for example, if John Eckstein has 100 shares of IBM um, and wants to sell them to Roger Jackson uh, here, that's a regulated transaction. Uh, the shares have been registered with the SEC and with the state of Colorado. Uh, Roger and I are both exempt because we are persons other than an issue dealer or underwriter under the federal and state law. Uh, and so that transaction can occur. Now, I still have, I have disclosure obligations to Roger, but I don't know much about IBM. And there's, but there's a lot out there. So my burden of disclosure is, is, is limited under Colorado law to the promise that, yes, I own these shares. Yes, I have the power to transfer them to, to, transfer them to you. But it doesn't go much beyond that. And that's also that's a transaction that's also regulated, not just under the securities laws, but also under the Uniform Commercial Code. Article 8 of the UCC covers investment securities. Um, I put in this second slide a definition of security. And that's only to remind everyone that um, there are many things can be securities, even though many people don't think they are. They are. Colorado security means any note, stock, treasury stock, bond, debenture, evidence of indebtedness, 
certificate of participation, pre-organization certificate, transferable share, investment contract. It goes on and on. And the first word is note. So a promissory note is a security, unless it's drafted out of the definition. So, so it's important to remember that if, we're, if you have investors in your company that have convertible notes, those are securities. If you have straight notes, those are often securities. So um, it's not just a piece of stock. Also, for people who are looking to raise money through using the internet, you have to know that the website you work with, Kickstarter and Indiegogo, do not permit securities to be offered. Again, buy or sell securities on Kickstarter. Circle Up, which is what we're one of our clients, embraces a bunch of money, is a broker dealer. It just happens to have a lot of businesses. Angel List is an investment advisor. So, it, there are six major securities laws, the 1933 Act, which covers the exemptions on uh, initial issuance and sale. 34 Act, which covers the aftermarket trading that I talked about with Roger, and also controls broker dealers regulation. The 1940 Investment Advisors Act, which deals with the uh, venture capital advisor, the exempt reporting advisor I talked about, and also the advisors to mutual funds, the advisors to uh, uh, private equity. And then there's the Investment Company Act of 1940, which, which uh, uh, has exemptions from registration, but deals with pools of securities, like mutual funds themselves, like the venture fund itself, a limited partnership, and such. And uh, there's also the Trust and Denture Act of 1939, which we don't need to talk about today. But uh, moving to the, uh, it's important to understand the website if, and whether or not the website is regulated. Okay. And, and, I, and a good security lawyer can go in and look at a website and reverse engineer it and figure out what kind of a website, who are these people. So just, uh, I'm still, I'm in the third uh, slide, I'm just pointing out that the Jobs Act, which is where the crowdfunding authorization comes from. It was signed by President Obama on April 5th, 2012. There are seven titles, and I talked about, in a couple of my talks in this group, I talked about the Jobs Act before. Hmm. But Title II is Access to Capital for Job Creators. That's 506C, which we'll talk about in the next slide. And also Title III was crowdfunding. Um, the reason I'm gonna talk about um, Title II the new rule of 506C and make references to 506B, which exists, which was where 99.9% .9 of all private placements, exempt offerings took place before the Jobs Act, is because this is the place where you really can raise money on the internet. You're going to learn that I don't think much of crowdfunding. The private equity crowdfunding, the way the SEC and Congress defined it, is a really bad tool for small business and individuals. Anyway, um, the old 506B is, uh, which everybody uses still, is a safe harbor under the 1933 Act exemption for private placements. And all it says is offerings not involving a public offering. Public offering is not defined in the statute, but it's defined in other ways. So if you do an offering that's not a public offering, you and there are certain ways of doing that, that you can do, and that's a very common thing. If I had a company and I wanted to raise $50,000 and Roger wanted to put in twenty five, and Ben wanted to put in twenty five, that's a private placement. Yeah. I don't need to worry about Rule 506B and, and Reg D. I can do that kind of a deal. Okay. Um, if I use the safe harbor, that's good, but if I screw up the safe harbor, it's still under the statute, so it's still okay. By the way, there's an article on our Fairfield and Woods website, which I will encourage everybody to go to many times because it's information from a small business person interested in selling securities. I've used that article. I've used that article ever since I became a securities lawyer and came to Colorado. It's been updated a few times. 
but it's there. Information for the small business person interested in selling securities. It's the most often accessed uh, article on our website, and we can see who accesses it, and it's mostly associates from large law firms trying to see how to talk this way, because small business finance is not what big law firms teach young lawyers. In any event, it's just it's not a problem, it's just the way it is. How many, uh, the, how many companies have you done, say, with in-state equity stock issue? In-state would be an intrastate offering. That's uh, 3A11 of the 33 Act and Rule 147, 147A, not very many. I mean, I mean, people don't like the intrastate offering. The, the private placement offering, many, many, many hundreds. I've been, I've been a securities lawyer since uh, 1977. It was a tax event before that. <laughs> and uh, before Rule before rule 506B, its predecessor was an old rule called 146. And there was Rule 1 for then, Rule 146 before, I remember when Rule 136 Safe Harbor came out, so it was in the 70s. Okay. But uh, I think 506 came out in 90, I can't really remember, in, the, in, the, in 86, maybe. I just can't remember, but it doesn't matter. Uh, in any event, um, in, on this slide four, well, eventually I'll get my slides, or I'll just keep telling you what they say. Um, Title II, the one thing about a private placement or 506B is you cannot do general advertising and general solicitation. Not possible. You cannot do general advertising under 506B. Now, you can use, there are ways to use the internet, but that's not considered to be general advertising and solicitation by the SEC. There's, so there's this, um, the lamb lighter technology. It's difficult to find your investors. <laughs> well, you can do it, well, you don't make offers. There's, uh, this is not to, to get into detail, not the subject of the talk either, but um, you can solicit interest, uh, but you can't make an offer. And it has to be very specific. And there's a, there's a notion there with the SEC called Lamplighter Technologies that came out when the internet's not going. That allows, basically, you give people who are interested a uh, password so they can go behind the screen and get into the website where you have your private placement memo and all your data, but you can't make offers. What's an offer? An offer, in, in John Eckstein's view of the world, which is not necessarily the SEC's view of the world, is that if you say something, the other person can say yes or no, and then you have a contract. That's an offer. Yeah, so enough if I, specificity. Yeah, if I say, deal. Yeah. I'll sell you 20% of my company as it sits today for $100,000. And you say yes, that's an enforceable contract under Colorado law. It doesn't have to be in writing. You just sell securities. You've used, you've had a prospectus, and you're in the soup with that. But if you say, would you be interested if I wanted to sell, I don't know, maybe five, no, eight to 15% of my company? For I don't know, hundred to two hundred thousand dollars, they can say yes, but you don't have a binding contract there because you have all the facts. You don't have all the terms for the contract. It, it's too loose. So that's how Extend is rough. Uh, guess at it. Other lawyers will, will be more conservative, but uh, that's how I view the world. Ben, yeah, uh, from my limited. High school commercial law from a long time ago. They thought that oral contracts were enforceable. I understand. Uh, there are two things about oral contracts. There's the parole evidence rule. Uh, I'm going to back up. I won't give it to you. Okay. Uh, the point is, this, there's something called the statute of frauds, which used to require that certain types of contracts had to be in writing. The statute to be enforceable. The statute of frauds with regards to the sale of securities was amended in Colorado. So oral contracts for the purchase of sale of securities are enforceable. And there's a famous case where um, some unfortunate Chinese investors came to Colorado and, uh, and uh, an oral contract was enforced. It was like war, something Wharf Holdings, I can't remember the name of the case, but no, you have to be very careful. Now, 
people have to prove the terms of the contract, and it's very difficult to come up with a he said, she said kind of deal. And, but you're, you're, you're right at the time. The times have changed. Is at least in Colorado. Is that true? Oh. State I mean, by state. Oh, Chris, what I remember was, unless it was from necessities. I, I, I don't know. I haven't read the statute of frauds in decades. It was written in the statute of Colorado. So, so the point being 506B, no general advertising, no general solicitation. The Jobs Act brought in under Title II the opportunity to do general solicitation and do general advertising under 506C. And 506C is a very simple rule. Um, and both five, the reason people like 506B and 506C is it presumes the states, which means the State Securities Commissioner cannot stop you from offering securities if you are doing an offering under 506B or 506C. Remember now, five, because it's just the feds preempted the states. So 506B, which has been around for a long time, um, basically you're going to do a notice filing and pay a, a fee. It's, it's several hundred dollars, uh, but that's all you do with the state of Colorado. But you can't general advertise and no general solicitation. 506C, and once again, all this information is in the article on the website, a lot of information for the small business person interested in social securities. 506C, you can do general advertising. You can do general solicitation. However, a piece that you also have to have, you can only sell to accredited investors. You don't know what accredited investors are, raise your hand. Uh, okay, accredited investors, a millionaire not counting the house. Somebody made 200,000 a year for each of the last two years, expects to make it this year, or with their spouse, made 300,000 a year, or certain kinds of business entities that, and that have five million or more in assets. It's roughly a uh, accredited investor. Just Google it and you'll find lots of references. It means they can afford to lose the money. That, technically, that's correct. This definition hasn't been changed since 1986, which means over 10, there are books out there called The Millionaire Next Door. I mean, that's a 20 year old book. And there are a lot of people who are accredited now. Another thing that they're thinking of doing recently is amending the definition to add certain types of individuals to be, can be accredited. I have a visitor here. I, I was just seeing, I don't know why. And then the. Uh, the people who they're going to add is lawyers and accountants. And I love lawyers, but I wouldn't say that lawyers are necessarily sophisticated sometimes because of their knowledge about their investments. Are we still live or are you at point? No, you can't. It was just this thing. Okay. So, in any event, 506C, if you want to go for the wealthy people, you can do general advertising and general solicitation, but you have to take reasonable steps to verify that the purchases are accredited. And there are people out there who will do that for you. But there's still a big lift for an individual. It's, it's, it's really not. So then you can use a 506C offering for people who have some platforms that are not broker dealers, but they've set up this platform online and they've joined FinTech, which used to be called the NASD. So this, that's the self regulatory broker dealer organization. So once again, all the SEC likes to see regulators, intermediaries who are regulated. So the people who put up websites, and there are a number of websites out there as platforms for 506C offerings. Remember I told you, you got to reverse engineer those websites to figure out what they really are. Some of them might be 506C platforms, some might be broker dealers, some might be financial advisors, some might just be collecting the names of wealthy people. So, but this is all federal. Okay. In any event, uh, on slide seven, I moved to Title III equity crowdfunding. And uh, there's a lot of detail. We don't have the slides, so I feel a little inadequate here. Okay. But I'll just run through some of the uh, notions that are in the statute. Um, it's six pages for a non-self-executing exemption written into the statute. This is something Congress had a lot of trouble with. Whereas the private offering is just a one line says, offerings not involving a public offering. And this, and this one has six pages, and you still had to have rules to get it out. 
it is it is a very uh, Michael Bennett had something to do with getting the Jobs Act passed. So I always thank Michael Bennett when I see Senator Bennett for doing this. But it was really tough because the forces of regulators and the people who want to protect investors were tugging at the people who want to help get financing for small business. And it was a real tug of war back in um, 2012 when this was passed. In any event, um, Crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding is exemption from registration. And this is section 4A6 of the 1933 Act. Um, the aggregate amount, and I'm going to tell you first what was in the statute, then I'll tell you what was in the original regulations, then I'll tell you what's in the current regulations. But, uh, and it's what's in the current regulations that isn't in the slides that I need to update. Uh, but that's what's changed since um, the original uh, regulations came out and I gave this talk two and a half years ago. Um, and in that video, I assume is in the video bank uh, for access through the Rocky Mountain Inventors Association. But anyway, back, back in, uh, when the rings came out, um, which was two and a half years ago, so that would have been 2000, early, two, early uh, 2016, the rings came out. Um, but this is in the statute. You can't go over a million under uh, the issuer cannot raise more than a million dollars through crowdfunding in the previous 12 months. Um, the aggregate amount uh, sold in the previous 12 months to an individual in the crowdfunding is limited to $2,000 or 5% of the annual income or net worth of the investor, whichever is greater. Assuming the annual income or net worth of the investor is less than 100000 or 10% uh, of the lesser of the annual income or net worth of the investor not to exceed the maximum aggregate amount sold of 100,000, assuming both the annual income and net worth of the investor are worth 100,000. There's a lot of complications in this statute, statutory rule. Okay? I'm just giving you the highlights or lowlights. Transactions must be conducted through a broker or a funding portal, like the portal. It's a member of the NASD, uh, the uh, FINRA. Not available to foreign issuers. Issuers and intermediaries must fulfill a number of other requirements, including SEC filings, record keeping, disclosure, investor education, and it preempts uh, state regulations for the author. Well, that's a good thing. So the regulations, uh, thanks for allowing me to skip over a lot of stuff. Okay. But uh, the, the final regs came out May 16th, 2016 which um, basically said the same things in the regs that the statute said. Uh, there was no, they also said there was no integration with other exemptions. So you could have raised money in private placement and then you could do a crowdfunding option. They would not be jammed together because there's this concept of integration that says you can't, and at the theory of this is you can't take what otherwise would be a public offer and split it into a lot of pieces of exempt offerings, and then you escape the registration requirements. Yeah. So they have this integration rule that pulls things together. But when they explicitly say, the SEC, that it's not integrated, that's a helpful thing. So you can do your crowdfunding, even if you raise some small bit of money to fund your crowdfunding uh, from other individuals in the private placement, for example. Um, so the May 16, 216 rules said the transactions on a on a uh, the crowdfunding had to be done exclusively through one platform, one portal, one broker dealer, not for non-US entities, not for public reporting companies, not for prior uh, crowdfunders who didn't comply with the crowdfunding requirements, not for blank checks. You can't do it for crowdfunding for a pool. A blank pool, uh, a pool. You can't tell. You have to tell them what you can use the money for, okay? uh, specifically. And also, bad actors cannot use crowdfunding. And I bet what's a bad actor? Bad actor rules now apply to 506B, 506C. They apply to 504s, which I'll talk about a little bit. They apply to uh, a number of other things, so the regulation A offerings. It's basically a definition that goes back to the concept 
of these people need to keep, need to keep an eye on these people. They've been per permanently barred from violating the securities laws. That's a bad actor. If they violate the Postal Service regulations with regards to sales security, that's a bad actor. And they go through a long list. The bankruptcy does not make you a bad actor. But I mean, from my point of view, it's a disclosure item, but it's not. What about if you've been bankrupt like three or four times like Donald Trump? Uh, well, you should disclose that it would be material. But it'd be nice that people would understand the most important account. Right. Well, I, yeah, I, well, yes. I, I, I don't want to go there. Uh, yeah. It's election eve for those it's, it's, who are seeing this 20 years from now. Uh, I had a question on that. You said they can only raise off of that one, off of one portal now? That's the new race? That was in May 16, 2000. You only use one portal for your crowdfunding. Sorry, go ahead. And this is the feds, this is the federal crowdfunding. Because I'm also going to talk about. Um, so, like, um, if I have to think. So, if, is there jobs at stock out there? Is, it, is there any kind of market where it's bought and sold? Or? Sorry, season. No, there's no market. There's no aftermarket okay. for these are these securities. There's no aftermarket for them. And one of the, that's one of the problems. And we, we, I'll, I'll get the philosophy, public policy here, but many people in Colorado have spent a lot of time and in other states talking about the need for an aftermarket for small companies and restricted securities. You know, we there are like 16 exchange, stock exchanges in this country, and there's nothing for. They so have a thousand investors and they want to buy and sell stock. We can't do that yet. But there are ways to do it if you're rich and you can buy and sell in front of a Facebook offering. I mean, they got to do it. Okay. I'm just saying the, the, the unicorns and the multi millionaire type value companies have ways of doing things that aren't available to the small business person. Uh, like you, you'd still have to be accredited to be a buyer and all that. There's no aftermarket for trading. Now, you can always sell security if you're a willing buyer and willing seller. But there's not anybody come on. You know, I have a thousand shares of this and five hundred shares of that, twenty shares of this, anybody want to buy? Yeah, that's a regulated activity. So so just I just, think we're finally ready to get you. Okay, I'm on slide nine now, but I don't okay. just take too much time. Wow, that's why it's technical interruption. Technical interruption. <laughs> How I do, folks? I'm giving you. Uh, oh, no, there's no, still no, a lake, so we don't need that. I mean, just keep going. We're I'm going trying to do the slides. You know, the slides are later. Okay, yeah. You can thank Microsoft. Do you have the screen? I have a wall, apparently. The screen. Well, that was the thing you had. I mean, what I'm taking away is you're going to say that crowdfunding is not a great way to go and private placements offer a lot better options. I think, well, private placements are a lot more common and popular. Simple. It's much simpler than this crowd. Much simpler. You know, I mean, they try to do things, but it doesn't sound like it's really coming <laughs> out the way it's intended. No, and I'm going to, I want to, as soon as we get this cleared up, I want to also talk about the state, what the state's done. So I think for the state uh, crowdfunding, their approach, okay, which we had before the uh, federal regulations on crowdfunding came out, and how they've been changed a couple times. And uh, there, there are two more slides on crowdfunding, but you're getting the message. Okay. Well, I think the difference is, is private placement. You got, you have to know the individuals, or someone has to know them in order to bring them to the table. Crowdfunding, you throw it out there, and you. I hope that people see it and you don't know who they are. You put your pitch out, you talk to them, put your presentation, and then any anonymous individual can touch the you know, that, That's certainly a process. That's true. That is the safest true. way to look at it. You have to have a private, according to the SEC staff, for a 506 offering, 506B, you have to have a prior existing business relationship. And uh, that's a private, that, that's a for a private placement, yeah. Yeah, for business. a five for the safe harbor of five hundred six B. So, so by business relationship, let's say I'm a member of the Rocky Mountain Adventures Association, right? So, and there's a thousand members, right? And I'm a member. Do I have a business association where 
that could be offered as a private placement to the family. No, you have to have a personal relationship with each person in that place. I mean, that doesn't take a lot, though, if you go into six yeah. meetings, the right yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. But you got to know them well, for a reason through, other than getting their money. Right. You could do it through some kind of association. P people who are savvy on this are constantly building their lists of prospective investors and, and you know, meeting people. That's what all that networking is about that goes on out there. So that means if you're that shy, you're this is a rough way to go. <laughs> that means you could do like what about a LinkedIn connection to people? Well, do you know the people? Or are they on uh, Kevin and Bank? I mean they six steps removed. I mean if you know them, you know them. If you don't know them. Now um, this is the this is the forty five years practicing securities law point of view. I mean you you what would be a light Clinton, relationship, it could be a heavy relationship. What would Bill Clinton say? It depends on how you define it. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I'm there either. <laughs> but, I mean, a, a relationship, you can establish a relationship within hours. Yeah, I mean, yeah it, it just takes a lot of time. So yeah, you have to point. you know and really try to find out, you know, are they interested in your product? You're qualifying your prospect. I mean, it's like anything else. If you, if you go into a country club, you're more likely to be people who have invest in your company than if you don't. 506B offerings are unlimited number of accredited investors, but you only take in 35 unaccredited investors, and the unaccredited investors get specific disclosures, which include the audited balance sheet, if you can make one without undue uh, expense or time. Uh, it's it's um, 506B is still a way to go, though, and, People understand it on both sides of it. It's a fairly uncomplicated. Get your business plan together. I mean, there are other exemptions, uh, and I have a slide here uh, when we get there uh, for five for 147, 147A, and 504, which uh, are uh, all these are described in that article on the Fairfield the Woods website called "Information from a Small Business Person Interested in Selling." But, but since you want to jump in, why don't we just uh, pop uh, forward a little bit. Um, the, the, the regulations have, have these dollar limits, but uh, Congress uh, told in the Jobs Act, told the SEC that every five years they have to update the numbers for inflation. So the numbers have changed slightly. So this is different than what's in the slides. But, but fundamentally, for example, um, it's, uh, and it was changed once. It was changed uh, in April 2017. You go to the SEC uh, uh, release, uh, April 5th, 2017. It's 2017-78. You can go to the SEC. It's sec.gov. Go to the sec.gov. Look at... Um, Press releases. Look at um, around April 15, 2017. You can see what the numbers are. But if it was a million before, it's now a million seventy, a million uh, seventy thousand dollars. Uh, it was a hundred thousand before, it's now a hundred seven thousand. Uh, it was two thousand before, it's now two thousand two hundred. I mean, all these slides, uh, it's up a little bit. I don't know whether. I, I think in our, I have to say that now that I stand here on in that article, information for the small business person, we basically say about crowdfunding, don't do it, we don't recommend it. And the, the, the real answer is fair from the woods to the wild. It's too expensive to use a lawyer to try to follow all these rules to get, I mean, you don't want to pay us, okay? And you won't want to pay. You might be able to use um, a solo practitioner if you have insurance for them to spend time. We talked about state uh, crowdfunding, which I will go to next. You'll be I like it. Oh, okay. So, so, you can so let's, let's move up to. Can you guys see this? It's not moving up there. Yeah, it's, not, it's moving here. I see it. Huh? Not moving up there. No, it's not moving at all. Is it moving here? Oh, there he goes. Gonna hold it. Okay. Is 
there some kind of a um, here we go. Sorry? Is, is there some kind of a, if you're saying that the cost of crowdfunding is too expensive, is there some kind of a um, in my humble uh, opinion for yeah, investors? But, but is there a type of a, what do they call that? Uh, you know, like there's a legal form thing you can buy online. Is, is there some kind of a, uh, a pre-packaged? Not that I know. Thing? But that doesn't mean I know it all. Wouldn't there be a market for something like that? Sure, there's a market, but you're going to have to get a lawyer to prepare the document. Yeah. You know, actually, you don't. Very careful, very experienced entrepreneur could, could get it done. It's just, uh, let, let me finish my talk and we can talk about it later on. But can you see that? Basically, okay, so I, I've danced over and around the equity crowdfunding at the federal level. Okay. I've mentioned how it's um, the statute came out, then the, uh, the rules came out, and then how they were updated. <laughs> now we're talking about what happened in Colorado. Right. I'm sorry. sorry. Um, do you all want the front door or do you need us to lock the front door? What's that? Do you all want the front door or do you need us to lock the front door? We're just wrapping up code. Oh, yeah, you could lock that. Okay, we just locked this one. Got it. Sorry. Thank you very much. Well, because it took the SEC so long to come out with the rules for crowdfunding, the equity crowdfunding rules at the federal level were the last rules under the Jobs Act to come out. And they had a real tough time. Remember, there were six pages of things. Um, and they didn't understand small business in the first place. The state of Colorado um, went ahead, our Securities Commission went ahead, and came out with uh, his own set of rules at the uh, instigation of um, some small business lobbying groups. And in fact, uh, it was um, the Colorado Bioscience Association, the Colorado Technology Association, the Colorado Clean Tech Industry Association, these tech-oriented trade associations that wanted to help those kind of entrepreneurs get started financing the lobby the state legislature to get it done. And uh, just I can't I think the how I think there was a the Senate was controlled by the uh, Republicans and the, the Democrats controlled the House and they still got this done. This was a law that was heavily uh, influenced by our Securities Commission. And you can find the Colorado crowdfunding uh, Exemption at, uh, uh, forgive me, Colorado Revised Statutes 11 51 308. Point five. So, Dan Pavone was the Democratic sponsor, and actually, this was in 2015. So, um, I was asked to give uh, advice to the three trade associations, live, live legislative committees. And here we again we have a very long statute, proposed statute. Uh, and uh, it wasn't the law that I wanted it to be or that people who do business wanted it to be. But there is a, a legislative declaration in the front of this, which is important to know. Because this legislative declaration, legislature is saying, small business is important, lack of capital is important. We think the costs of raising money can outweigh the benefits. We don't do something about this. Crowdfunding for raising money is restricted by our laws, and in essence, uh, crowdfunding is a good thing. So we think we should have this exemption. But so, so it's basically recognizing it's hard to raise money in Colorado. We want to crowd. The problem with the law is that it threw a lot of particular barriers in, and 
It was, once again, Harry Lidstone was the primary draft. He's a good guy. He's at the law firm of Burns, Fiega, and Will. In fact, if you want to do crowdfunding, federal, state, go to Burns, Fiega, and Will. Talk to Harry Lidstone or one of the associates there. Maybe they could help you out. But in essence, uh, came out with this law. And without going into detail, I have some of the detail up here. It's hard to see, though, isn't it? Uh, this was still born. No one ever filed under the Colorado Crowdfunding Act to raise money, the original act. So they went and amended it the next year. And no one filed under that one either. By the way, this slide is from uh, is that a day? Uh, the proposed changes the legislature says now that's from 2016. Those changes were made. So, um, uh, let's see what I can do this. Oh. I don't know the, I'm not doing well here. Well, let me put a battery in it. I just want to advance the slide. <laughs> It's working. Is it working now? No, I'm trying to get it to advance. So guys, we're good. Let me get Well, in any event, let me keep going here. So, um, a group of people got together to uh, uh, try to amend the statute to make it work. And this was uh, in last year and this year. So we had a hearing, and uh, I was asked to go to the hearing and commented on Eric's proposed changes and other people's proposed changes. And the, the Securities Commission came out with his proposed changes. Then Eric had some comments on it. They had a public hearing on that, and they made a few minor changes. And that's in this, that's in this slide you can't see, which is slide 12. But fundamentally, all they did was uh, they allowed the intermediaries under Colorado crowdfunding, rather than have to be paid money, to think you could give them a piece of stock in your company. But prior to the adoption of these regulations, um, one of the, there's a there's one website that's out to be the platform for crowdfunding in Colorado, and it is called. Um, The fellow's name is Carl Dakin. The name of the website is Invest Local Colorado. And Carl, in the, in the hearing before the regulations came out, uh, said hmm. under Colorado crowdfunding, it probably costs an, an, an offer or $50,000, and it shouldn't cost that much to, to try to raise two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars And I take that as a gift. Um, so at least he took out the 15000 that Carl was charging to use his website, although I don't know whether he makes any money. I, I just went to the website before I came over here, and there are a lot of other things on that website, like investor groups and deals and things. So it's a, if, if Carl's a straight-up guy, and I have no reason to think he's not, then there's, there's an opportunity to find investors through that site, even if you don't. Do a color fund crowdfunding, but the biggest problem is always been, in my mind, finding an escrow agent, someone who will hold the money before you uh, get the minimum. The regulations always said that you had to escrow. I say you let it raise uh, seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. You had to escrow three hundred seventy-five thousand, and only when you got there, the first three hundred seventy-five, did you get your money. So you couldn't do, but, the, but uh, I've talked to, I talked to talked to a bunch of escrow agents, and we couldn't find, ever find anybody who would do it. But here, this this is in your slides. I still think it's hard to find an escrow agent. But these rules came out July thirty first, two thousand eighteen, and I don't know uh, anyone who's done under under these new rules that just came out several months ago. I sent an email around the office, nobody knows, but then we don't really work in this 
space. We do a lot of sort of funding, but so our, our lawyers go out to the meetings and try to listen to how people raise the money. This is not one of them. So, so just to mention some other things that are responsive to what Roger asked uh, halfway through. There are other exemptions from registration which allow for use of the internet and have their own sets of rules. Uh, rule 504, uh, which you may know, uh, uh, now goes up to $5 million. You got to comply with the bad actor provisions. But that's really driven by the state exemptions, not the federal exemption, because there's no preemption. So you got to find exemptions under the, st under the state securities laws as well as from the federal. That's a tough one to use. Uh, I had said in my prior talk here, here two and a half years ago that the uh, state crowdfunding is actually a registration under the state laws. But under the federal laws, it's relying on an exemption. And the exemption it relies on is 147, which if you remember what I said about 20 minutes ago, uh, there's an intrastate offering in response to Roger. 3A11 as the 33 Act and the Safe Harbor is Rule 147. Talked a little bit about it on this slide. Um, now, under the uh, new and old 147, um, you still should be making offers outside the state, but you can use Rule 147A. Uh, rule 147A which the SEC came out with, which is not the basis for Colorado crowdfunding, but I assume from the amendments, so it is. It says that we can make offers outside the state, but not sales outside the state. So it's all, so it's not true. It's not truly an interstate offering because the statute cases say you can't make offers in Wyoming, you'll blow your 147 exemption. But 147A says you can make offers outside the state, just not sales. That's the SEC talking. There are no cases interpreting 147A, but it does give the state securities commissioners um, re registered crowdfunding equity online sales opportunity that's complicated. The less complicated than the feds, if you can find an escrow agent, an opportunity to do it. I mean, that's that's those portals don't find they don't it's like Kickstarter, they you know raise you the money, but you you can't give me the money until you've raised the, the money. You have st still got some you're using Carl Dakin's portal. I don't think I don't know if he's ever done any offering successfully on the portal. Right. But he's a legitimate registered uh, portal with the state securities commissioner for doing a, a Colorado uh, registered equity crowdfunding uh, that complies with the federal exemption under 147A. But it's a registered offer. Okay. Ask the lawyer, why does everybody look for an exemption? Why don't they want to be registered? Because with a registered offering, you have to file a registration statement with the regulator, like the State Securities Commission. You make a mistake in there, <coughs> they can sanction you. Just a mistaken filing. It's a mistake. You don't need intentional, knowing, or reckless. Yeah. You don't need to be fraudulent. Right. You just to be negligent. You get in trouble just by filling out the form. Yeah. That's the danger of using a registered offer. And in this case, that's our state securities commissioner, who has always been a prosecutor his entire life. He's never been anything but a prosecutor. He doesn't know much about um, how the industries work from a business sense, and he has ignored the regulations. This legislative declaration at the beginning of that section, it says small business needs help, let's use equity crowdfunding to raise it. So next I mean, is on the record here is the Jerry, Jerry Rowe. Jerry, you're still not giving up enough of a break. <laughs> Let's, let's, but I, I think because now we tried to do it through legislation once, we amended the legislation, then we tried to do it for changing the regulations, and we still haven't gotten to a place where it's easy enough for people who, who mortgage, get the second mortgage in their house, and want to go out and, you know, just raise some money to keep the current grocery store going, 
which is a real good use. I mean, get everybody in the neighborhood to put in a couple hundred thousand to keep the grocery store going, and they could all own a piece of it and get a discount. And you still don't have that in Colorado. But that's, you know. But do you have to, I mean, being a Colorado resident, do you have to use uh, the raise money in Colorado to get you raise money outside of here? The principal place of business for a Colorado crowdfunding offering needs to be in Colorado. And the Rule 147 rules say 80% of the assets, 80% of the operations is 80%. So, uh, so where have I got to? I've gotten to my conclusions in this long talk. A lot of complications with the federal equity crowdfunding to raise a relatively small amount of money. Fewer complexities than the federal budget. You can't have to be able to find the escrow agent. And then uh, federal rule 506B or C is still better advantages than a crowdfunding alternative. The one thing that the state regulation changes came in said was that the commissioner could by rule come up with other kinds of escrow agents besides depository institutions like banks and savings and loans and trust companies. And I have been, in my expression of things, and Eric Lidstone has put this in some of his articles, why can't law firms be the escrow agent? We hold money for people all the time. So we're fiduciaries. We can lose our licenses. It does, but I mean, we can lose our licenses from the Supreme Court. They can pull our license, not the Securities Commission. Why can't accounting firms hold money? They do that sometimes. Why can't real title insurance com title companies who do closings for real estate? Why can't they hold the money? Why does it have to be a big a bank? A depository institution has to be of a certain size and substance. Where you know. Well, because you have our buying the statute, we want to help small businesses, help them deal with the let the people who can lose their licenses or lose their ability to do business, so they have a skin in the game, even though it's not regulated by the securities commissioner. Let them be the ones to hold the money. If you have to have somebody hold the money, but that escrow agent is in the statute, so you have to not not who it is, but the need for an escrow person. Is that state. only for state? Is the escrow agent? It's in the state. Uh, yeah, not it's not in the federal. Not one. in the federal. Okay. But as I said, if it weren't for the fact that the state one is a red is a registration, so you're not supposed to make any mistakes. Uh, it's a it's it's a much easier thing to work with than the federal one because you don't have to um, track. The individual investors' money going into their deals. We have to track that two thousand two hundred dollars, hundred thousand a year stuff. That's hard to do if you're one issue or a small business. So, with that, uh, there are the articles which should click through. There's one article, information for the small business person, and there's another one, uh, private placements, uh, exemptions and disclosure. You can call me. I can. There are other lawyers at Fairfield the Woods, Gil Selinger, John Leonard, Peter Edwards, used to be a VC. Um, there are a lot of lawyers at Fairfield the Woods who know this stuff. Not so much the crowdfunding stuff, which we, it's not our space, but uh, there might be the oldest guy in town who's a securities lawyer, so do business strategies and discussion. We've done a lot of that. That's my bio. And uh, I'm done. So, it seems like private placement is the preferred. Private placement is still the safest, cheapest, fewest uh, hassle, fewest, 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 fewest lawyer regular. involvement, fewest account involvement. So what's what's the drawback of private placement? Is it just getting the investors? It's materiality and and the prior existing business relationship. If you want to use five or six, if you use just the private placement. The statutory 4A2 and the 33 Act, which is offerings not involving public offering. That, there's only one Supreme Court case interpreting that. It's called Ralston Purina. And the Ralston Purina case says that the private placement exemption turns on access to information. So if you are a if you're Phil Inches, if you're a billionaire, 
you can invest in some. They don't. The SEC, the, the Supreme Court will say, yeah, he should have known what he was doing. He was just sophisticated. He had the ability to bear the risk. No problem. We're not going to. That's a private placement. <clears throat> but if you have uh, a dozen widows and orphans, nobody's worth more than a couple hundred thousand or fifty thousand. And you just take their money without a disclosure document. And you know, the argument is they weren't sophisticated, they didn't have the ability to bear the risk, which are statutory, which are case law requirements for then you violated um, Ralston Purina because you didn't give the information. So the relative sophistication, the relative ability to bear the risk. The more sophisticated, the more ability to bear the risk, the less the disclosure. That's what the Supreme Court would say. Okay. Then this concept of 10b-5 came along, which is um, information from the small business person, information, excuse me, uh, material, you have to disclose all the material information uh, that a reasonable investor needs to make an informed decision, 10b-5, which is an SEC rule when it comes under Section 10b of the 1934 Act. And uh, that, there's a lot of cases under that saying what's material and what's not. And that is a uh, trap for the unwary. But you can, you can, disclosure works. If you've got somebody who's sophisticated, give them a big shoebox. Here, read it. Read all the stuff. You don't have to put it all. But then you're giving the same shoebox to 50 people is hard to do. That's why you come up with business plans and memorandums. So that's that's one sort of like everybody hears the same story. Sort of like your prospectus. But yeah, that's I mean, sorry. This may be a very far-fetched question, but is this, is this kind of the flip side of insider trading? It's 10 v 5 is, is part of insider trading. is part of 10 v 5 I mean, Insider trading under the 33 Act, the fraud sections are 17A, 1, 2, and 3. Under the 34 Act, the fraud section of 10B and Rule 10B5. Okay? Uh, the easiest case to prove is 10B5 case. And there's no private right of action in theory under 17A, 1, 2, and 3. So you assume under the 34 Act 10B if you're a private plaintiff. Um, but if you're the Fed, you come under 17A, 1, 2, 3. And there are negligence provisions under some of these. So it's not just intentional knowing or gross recklessness, it's negligence. So we like to be exempt and we like to be, you can fight about materiality. It's a better fight than should you have been registered and not registered. That's a yes or no. You don't ever want to get that. You have to fight that fight. Better to fight. Well, he thought it was material. We don't think it's material. This is why. And there's a full, total mix of information that was available to an investor. It depends how much that investor, if that investor reads a lot of newspapers and has a lot of information, your bird, disclosure burden is a little bit different. If they're, if they're off the internet and they don't have any print, they don't know anything. That may not be responsive, but that's the answer to the question. <laughs> so, so we're doing that. The bottom line is crowdfunding for equity. It's pretty much a washout. Federal and state. It still it hasn't. It has moved since. We were all so excited in 2012. I know people were excited, but but that was not. They hadn't read the statute. That Jobs Act really. I mean, they got it through the door, but the SEC kept pulling. They had trouble with. I mean, it was such a long exemption. It didn't self-execute. I talked to Senator Bennett, he kept waiting, he said, John, when the rebel's going to come out. He wanted to run like, for re-election based on he got this thing done. They tried to say, you know, Michael, it didn't happen the way you want. I mean, it doesn't work. You can't use yeah, it. Was, it was all the fanfare on the announcement. I know. And then it just kind of like vaporized. It's well, everybody went out there. Hole. Everybody <laughs> went out there. All the techies went out there thinking they were gonna get, it was going to happen. They were Yeah, it was like all there. the startups were going to get money. And yeah. Well, nobody likes to go out and chase after it. Yeah. You know, they like to be able to make a presentation and people come to you. But, well, you know, if you that'll work for a 506C offering, uh, where you can only 
have accredited investors and get fair right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But, but, I mean, you can put it out in the newspaper now. Couldn't do that before. I was 6B, you can't put it out in the paper. But it's basically says, everybody who's worth $2 million or more, come and meet me at XYZ if I want to make a pitch to you and be interested in this. Or you can, see, you can put it out in the paper still. Wow, okay. I mean, there's things you can do. It's just, you know, those ads cost money too. Sure, yeah, for sure. So it's just hard for the individual. Hey, at the beginning, you were talking about the the, the funds that Maki's Venture does. Mm -hmm. is, is that like a private equity deal then? By definition, a venture capital fund is a private equity. Is, that, is private equity. But private equity, from a business point of view, usually they're buying the whole company. Venture capital. Oh, I, yeah, I get Venture you. capitalists, they don't, yeah, they're they don't getting want a share. Buy, they don't want to have control. They want to have written contracts, but they, they don't want to have control of things. Then they have exposure and risk. Right. When you're a private equity firm, you can get sued because it's a company. You know, they can go That's change the whole thing. Page private page equity, they have the, the limited investors, but they don't liability from the company that they transfer. Yeah, you, if you're private equity, you, you can take you own the business. You're just a subsidiary. So yeah, um, yeah there's a. It, it gets pretty. We don't have any private equity firms. Not very many. Based in Colorado, I don't represent any. I'm used to. Is that as active as it once was? I know it was big. Oh yeah, there's a lot. There's a group called the Association for Corporate Growth (ACG). I belong to the local chapter. They have chapters all over, and that uh, private equity sort of taken over Association for Corporate Growth. It used to be an organization where the acquisition people from big corporations would go to fund companies to buy. And then it became an organization for lawyers and bankers and accountants to try to find business. And now it's that, but but the private equity guys, the guys might have over two, three, four billion dollars. They have some stringers to in Colorado and they go. The lawyers sort of they want to be hired anymore. When the, the depths of the uh, the uh, recession, 2008, private equity firms were selling companies back and forth to each other. Because there was nobody else that they knew who had any money. Oh, they could get rid of their companies, but they had to turn over the companies with their inventory, so they sold companies to each other. I'm saying, where's the economic add to the gross domestic product there? I mean, it's no, it's just no, it's just spinning dollars. So the, it's just the a churn, fees, right? <laughs> but the fees to manage a fund, to pay for the house and car and all that, of the people who work at the private equity advisor. In 2010, all those private funds that are exempt reporting advisors, they now have to register as investment advisors. So it got more regular because they were being a part of the problem. Anyway, thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Thank very you. Much. I'm done. Thanks. And here are my handouts, which you do want. Yeah.